inside the Canadian House of Commons. Um, I, I didn't really come to talk so much about international public legal matters as I did to come and talk a little bit about why this election in front of us is just so important. Uh, the first thing I want to let you know as, a, as an individual, for me as a person, in case you don't know, I spent 10 years of my life outside of Canada. So my perspective on Canada and my perspective on this election and my perspective on Canadian society and Canada's role in the world, I think is probably more aligned with your perspectives than they would be with other Canadians' perspectives. For example, my wife and I, when we were first married, took our first assignment and went off to work in West Africa, working for the United Nations, working for UNICEF, running vaccination campaigns for kids, trying to convince governments in West and Central Africa to ratify the treaty to protect children and invest in child and maternal health rather than investing in armaments, armies, and conflict. And my international career was able to go on for many years after that. And so my perspective on what we're trying to build in Canada is different, I believe, than many of my colleagues who sit in the House who don't have the benefit, never had the privilege of serving overseas. Whether my work was in China, whether it was in Russia, in the former USSR after the wall fell, whether it was in Southern Africa, or whether it was in Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia. What I came to understand was Canada's unique and special role in the world. It's not just a place to come to. We would all agree that many, many millions of people all over the planet would like to join us here and now. It's no wonder we have such a long, long waiting list for folks who want to immigrate to Canada. We built something extraordinary in Canada. It's not just a place to come to because it's a, a place of opportunity. It's a place to come to because the world, the world now looks to Canada as a beacon, as a light on the hill, as a place to try and copy, to emulate, a place where we overcome differences, a places where we value and cherish our differences, a place, is that, a place where everyone has a seat at the dining room table, a place where everybody has a seat in Parliament, a place where your kids and your grandkids have the same opportunity, the equality of opportunity, as all other kids. That's what we're building. I tell this story, my next story, uh, just to give you a sense of how far this country's come. On my father's side, he was the sixth of six children. And he was the only one to go past grade eight in, in education. His five brothers and sisters went to work when they were 16 years old, either on the farm, or maybe they were working in a pulp and paper mill, like my grandfather did as a security guard, working the midnight shift. My grandfather was an illiterate Irish immigrant. My grandmother married at 16 years old, on my father's side, to a 32-year-old husband. He died early. They lost the farm. She came into Ottawa, and she ran a boarding house. She ran a boarding house so she could afford to feed her own children. That's my father's side of the family. On my mother's side, she is one of five sisters with a mother who was a single mother whose father abandoned the family. And my grandmother raised her five daughters by taking in other children, the Children's Aid Society, and getting support to be able to feed those kids and feed her own five daughters. And the older girls went to school so that the younger girls could go to school. Went to work so the younger girls could go to school. Does that sound familiar? Yes. 
Does that sound familiar? That's not an extraordinary story. That's the Canadian story, isn't it? It's our story. And my grandparents in the farm used to have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and feed the fire so they wouldn't freeze to death. Now, we've come a long way. We built something unique. And the reason I'm standing here, and the reason my brother Dalton is standing as the Premier of Ontario, is because of equality of opportunity. That's what it is. When I knock on your doors and meet your kids and meet your grandkids, I am always, always amazed. I run into young women living in city living housing where your kids, they're 23, they're 21, they're finishing their master's degree in biochemistry, they're starting their PhDs in sociology, they're in law school, they're looking at medicine, they're doing accountancy, your sons are in trade schools, they're at college, and they're working their way, working their way into opportunities in Canada. That's what this election is all about. That's what my brother's been fighting for, what my family's been fighting for, for 50 years. My parents always taught us, it is not good enough to their 10 kids, six brothers, four sisters. Sound familiar? Right? There's nothing like a big family. Right? My father used to say that there were five kids on one side of the dining room table and five kids on the other side. And he said they were all within arm's reach in case he had to grab them. Right? He was a tough guy. He was a tough guy. And he went to work. And he worked and he worked to give us the opportunity to go to school and get a better shot at life better living for ourselves, for our families. We have never forgotten that. We're not fancy people. We're not rich people. We're not money people. We're not celebrities. We are people who understand what it is to be family members, what it is to stand on the shoulders of the generation that's come before you, just as your children are standing on your shoulders, and they will. This election is about what kind of society we want. What kind of place do we want to build for our kids and ourselves? My brother Dalton has invested, for example, more money in health care in the last eight years than any government in any province in Canadian history. Remember the last government, the Conservative government? They closed, they closed 26 hospitals. They fired six and a half thousand nurses. They wanted to close medical schools. Our doctors were fleeing to the United States. Foreign doctors were not getting their accreditation. All that's changed. In the last eight years, we've opened 18 new hospitals in Ontario. We built a brand new medical school in Ontario. We've doubled the size of the residency spaces for our doctors to get more specialists. We're fast-tracking foreign doctors who are accredited outside of Canada so they can get practicing now. 96% of Ontarians today have a family doctor. We've opened now some 200 healthcare practice groups right across the province. Right here in Ottawa, how many new MRI machines? We're working on number 10 right now. Number 10 new MRI machines in eight years. A brand new cancer care center on Smythe Road, wasn't there eight years ago. A brand new stem cell research center on Smythe Road, wasn't there seven years ago. A doubling of the size of the eye institute for our eye surgeries, for our cataract surgeries, wasn't there. Doubling the size of the Children's Hospital Emergency Department. Twelve new operating rooms at the Ottawa Hospital. Doubling the size of the Heart Institute. Seven hundred million dollars into Carleton University and Ottawa University. A whole new campus for Algonquin College. A whole new campus for Cité Collégiale. Don't forget those investments. We take them all for granted. We can't take them for granted. Together we have built something very extraordinary here. We're now transforming the electricity system in Ontario. Does anyone really think that an electrical system built 80 years ago is going to withstand the next century? Does anybody really think we can continue to burn dirty coal and cost $3 billion a year in health care costs for folks living in the greater Toronto area and in Ontario? 
Why would we want to do that when we have all kinds of new technologies? When the Americans are going to get off coal very soon, they're going to be looking, where can we go and find our new technologies for the best energy sources in the world? Is it any surprise or any mystery? Do you know what the jurisdiction that builds more cars more efficiently in North America? What jurisdiction is building more cars in North America than any other? Ontario. Answer? Ontario. 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 Yeah. Michigan is furious with us. Right? Alabama is competing with us. My brother, the premier, just landed a massive Toyota plant, get this, to build not North America's, but the world's first electric cars. This is what's coming. This is where our kids are going to be employed. This is the technology of the future. It's not by magic that we are the number one car producer. And it won't be by magic that we're going to become the number one producer in clean technologies. This is where the world is going. Unless we want to continue to play cards or Russian roulette with the atmosphere by putting as much greenhouse gas as we wish into it and not expecting climate change to, de to desertify even more of sub-Saharan Africa, or not expecting climate change to create sea level rise and have countries disappear in the Caribbean, we have to get on top of this challenge. This election is about looking after each other. It's about making sure we all have a good shot. Otherwise, how do you explain my brother's government creating 200,000 new college and university spaces in the last seven years? building four new undergraduate universities starting next Friday morning if he's re-elected. Four time increase in the number of apprenticeships for our kids. We're investing now in the future. Of course we're in a difficult time right now. Of course the European economy is going through some difficulties and the American economy is going through the difficulties. But what do you do when you're going through difficult times? You invest in your people. So when times pick up again, we are ready for takeoff. <coughs> and by the way, by the way, Ontario has created more full-time jobs since the recession ended than every province in Canada combined. In fact, we've not only recovered 100% of the jobs we lost in manufacturing from 2008, we've actually increased it by another 15%. Now, you don't get this on CFRA, do you? Right? Lowell Green isn't going to tell you this. Right? Because Lowell Green and his team, you know, are obviously they have a they have an axe to grind. They're very, you know, they're very negative, they're very divisive, they're very angry. I'm going to st stop and talk about this for one second. This is very, very important. In my mind, as a man whose first child was born in Africa, whose second child was born in London, England whose third child was born in Rome and Italy, and his fourth child was born here, and who's still negotiating with his wife for more. <laughs> well, I think I'm losing that negotiation. I need to talk to a few of the women afterwards. The point is this. The point is this. In my mind, okay, there is no us and them. There are only new Canadians, newer Canadians and newest Canadians. A Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. Okay? This, talk, this talk about foreigners versus Canadians and who, you know, my brother's tax credit he's proposing for, the, for very qualified professionals, engineers, right, professors, researchers. Mr. Hudak during the debate attacked my brother for his support. I think it's a $30 million fund. $12 million, $12 million no, for the uh, foreign scholars. $30 million fund to bring in the best and the brightest minds from all over the world, including Somaliland, including Sub-Saharan Africa, bring in the best and the brightest minds in the world and give them support so they can come and do the research here. Mr. Hudak attacks my brother for this. Right? My brother says to him, Mr. Hudak, do you know that foreign students into Ontario are bringing a billion dollars a year in support to our universities? A billion dollars a year? Do you know how many Saudi Arabian students are in Ontario this year? Thousands. Thousands. And they're choosing Ontario universities because of the quality of investments, the quality of teaching, the quality of their accreditation.
It's not a mystery that they're coming here. It's not a mystery that my brother's been leading trade missions all over the world selling post-secondary education and Ontario's ability in post-secondary education. Everyone likes to talk about Harvard, big school. Do you know what the second most published university in the world is after Harvard? University of Toronto. University of Toronto. Fabulous school. We have fabulous universities. So when Mr. Hudak talks about foreign workers, and he talks about foreign students, and he talks about something I just heard on the street from a very angry man telling me that we're doing way too much for new Canadians, and why aren't we doing something for his kids? And I have to tell him that in countries like Italy, where I used to live, they're now running ads all over the world to attract people to immigrate in Italy because they're running out of people. We cannot let Canadians, we cannot let Ontario be divided. We all come from backgrounds where we've witnessed conflict and we've witnessed division. When I was a child, my grandmother used to tell me how much she hated the English. <laughs> because she was Irish. And she was Irish Catholic. And I need, need I remind you that the Irish Catholics and the Irish Protestants fought each other okay, for 400 years. Right? They weren't, they, you know, they, they probably should have been drinking more beer. I don't know what it was. But they should have solved this problem a long time ago. But we cannot elect Canadian, we cannot let Canadian society be divided. We cannot let our children, right? As my mother once said to my grandmother at the dining room table, dinner table, 10 kids, and my grandmother was giving us the story about when she was a child and she was told by the English aristocracy that run this city that the Irish should go back to the Ottawa Valley. They were then called the filthy Irish. <laughs> it wasn't so long ago. That was not so long ago. The French were down in Lower Town and the Irish were in the Ottawa Valley and the Polish were kept over here and the English were here. What? We're not there anymore. It's the 21st century. The theme of my brother's campaign is simple. Forward together. There is no us and them. There can never be us and them. Every week another delegation comes into Parliament from another country and I always get the same question. Mr. McGinty, how is it possible people from 150 countries or more come into this country, live together, build together, prosper together, respect together, yes, love together. How is it possible with so much strife, so much division, so much conflict? A lot of, this, the, a lot of these differences come from fear, from ignorance, right? from misinformation, from the wrong people who are running radio shows in the morning. <laughs> Right? Not bringing us together, but ripping us apart, trying to rip us apart. This election has a lot to do, trust me, trust me on this. This conservative group, I'm not confident that they share this, this vision at all. I think they will use tactics to try to divide and split us and them. We must protect ourselves against this as a society. We cannot have this. We cannot have this. I won't allow it with my children. I'm sure you will not allow it with your children. It's just, it's just not right. Finally, let me say this that's practical about the election. Let me assure you that Dalton McGinty and myself, as his brother, representing the same district, have never taken your community or any community for granted. Never. That's not the way we're wired. It's the art of the possible. My father used to always say, politics is not policy. Politics is people, isn't it? Politics is people. <laughs> it's about looking after everyday people, everyday needs, and always trying to do the right thing. That's when my brother brought in a health care premium. Do you think that was politically popular? But he had to do it. He had to do it to make sure the emergency departments were there for the kids had to do it to make sure that the early learning in junior kindergarten he's bringing into every school in Ontario by 2014 could be paid for. Because we know, we know 
We know that if we get to kids at three and a half and four, get them into learning from four years old until seven, we know their chances for success are much higher after 12, 14 years old. Right? This election is about coming together, but there's another reality here. You can't split the vote. If you split the vote across the province, across the community, across Ottawa South, across Ottawa West, across other places, if you vote NDP and you split the vote, you're going to get a Conservative government. You're going to get a Conservative government. If you split the vote, so I let you, I let you come to your own conclusion about that. I'm asking you not to do so. There are a lot of shared values amongst all the parties. Okay, there are. I think there's a lot of shared values between the Liberal Party and the NDP. I think there are some things that the NDP are doing that the Premier would support, and there's some things that the Conservatives are doing that the Premier would support. I know that's the case because so much of what the Premier is doing, right, some, so many of his ideas are in their platforms. But it's, we now need to come together to make sure that we hold the seats and expand the seats that we have. And I need your help. We need your help to do this. I know Wally, for example, is running here locally in Ottawa South. I've worked with him for five or six years. He's a fine and decent young man. And he's doing a good job running his campaign. But if we split the vote, you have to ask yourself whether you're prepared to have Premier Hudak <laughs> sit at a table. Now just think about this, because it's going to start next year. Do you want Premier Hudak sitting at a table and negotiating a 10-year health accord with Prime Minister Harper? No. I don't think so. I don't think that that's right. I think you need to have some healthy tension between the Ontario and the federal government. If we want to get Ontario's fair share from the federal government, we need a leader who's going to speak for 13 million people, who's not going to take instructions from the Prime Minister's office and Mr. Harper's office. So there's a lot at stake here in this election. What kind of society we want. Equality of opportunity. Don't forget, my brother's going to cut tuition fees by 30%. For your kids in college, your kids in university. Right? We're going to increase the number of spaces by another 60,000 in the next five years. So everybody gets a fair shot at it. There's a very famous ad on television put on, I think it's done by IBM. And IBM has an ad saying, what's our, you know, they're in the boardroom, they're trying to figure out what, what's our most important asset? You know, is it capital, is it technology, is it this, is it that? And finally, they pan over to a warehouse where people are working and somebody points out the window and look, camera shines through the window and the person says, no, our most important asset is our people. Our people in Ontario. We don't have oil and gas. Okay? We have manufacturing. We have high-end finishing. We have new technologies. We've got cars. We've got all kinds of things for us. Hence the investments that are being made. So I'm asking for your support. I'm asking for you to get the word out in the community. I'm asking you to let your family and friends know we need you to vote on the 6th. You can vote before. Go to your returning office, wherever you're from, whatever your riding is. You can vote 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. any day, up to and including Election Day. But we need your support in this election. There's a lot at stake. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Adam said, we have been uh, for liberal for the last 20 years. We have been uh, voting for you in the south of uh, Ottawa. I think you know me very well. Yeah. Now, Somaliland community is being isolated. It's not being supported by government of, from, of, of Canada, of Ontario, I'm sorry, Ontario. Mr. Abshir there is our president there. He's struggling, he's struggling to <coughs> pay the office, the rent of the office. We need you 
we will support your brother and we'll support you later on when, you, when your election comes. But what we need in return is that you recognize Somaliland community role Service. in this country. Services Center. Somaliland is doing very, very well. It's exemplary in Africa. They, had, they held five elections without recognition in peaceful, in tranquility, and Africa is looking at, at, at Somaliland. The uh, president of uh, second, third person of the parliament is here. He's a member of parliament. We can, you know, confirm that. But we need your help. Mr. Bafsir, <coughs> we'll be knocking your door. We need your help in return. That's all we need. My name is Libat Hassan. I work for Adults McGinty here in Ottawa South, and uh, from your community. Um, so I'd like to start off by saying our door is open. As a few of you who've contacted us with issues, we've helped solve them. We've pointed you in the right way. But our door is open, and you have a direct line to the Premier of Ontario. Not other communities. Other communities don't get this opportunity. You're in a very key position right now. And with the support of David McGinty, of course, we're always able to sit down and discuss issues in this community. Very good. That's, that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is the same thing David has said over and over again. This community, our community here in Ottawa South, if we don't mobilize and go and vote, we will be directly affected here. If the votes are split and they go a certain way, you'll have a government that is not interested in your interests at all. Last time these people were, were in power, we had 25% cut from social spending. You know, Ontario Disability Support, there's nothing there. People trying to get on their feet, there's no support there at all. We're offering 30% off tuition. We're offering extended day programming for your children so you don't have to pay for daycare. These are simple things that we need to appreciate and fight for at the same time. But putting that aside, if you need to sit down and speak with us, our office is open. I just, I just want to tell the, the, the Premier that uh, the Somalia community has no friendship with the federal government. Uh, these are natural liberals. Uh, they always voted liberal. So you, uh, I, I don't think you'll find one person that has any doubt. Uh, and these are very sophisticated people. Sure. These are the, uh, the community leaders. Uh, we could not invite the community uh, as a whole. So uh, we, made, we made sure that uh, the, the, this invitation was limited. Uh, and these people are, are, are people who could easily filter what Lord Green is saying. <laughs> at the CFI. <laughs> so uh, uh, we are the natural base of the, the liberal uh, community. We are the people that are fighting people in the buses for the liberal path. Uh, for the, for, uh, the, the, when I'm talking about this, uh, the Somalian community. So uh, we're here to support you and to tell you that, that we, we, we would like to and support and return in the future. And that, and we would like to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody with a question? I've seen each other before. Uh, uh, what I wanted only is, you know, uh, I, I don't think your brother is in danger, you know. Uh, and I am in his riding, and I know we will vote for him. And I hope the, the, the Liberal Party will, uh, will win the election. Because the status quo in Ontario is now the best that it can be. Uh, there's one thing that uh, I would like to ask of you. 
uh, there is a fellow liberal MP uh, uh, from Toronto, a Jim Christian, yes, who is a great champion of Somalia. Yes, and he is in all our hearts, and he has a place in the history of Somalia. I would uh, ask you today to be another champion of Somalia in the parliament, because we believe if only another MP uh, seconds Mr. Kiritianis in his endeavor to help that nation that they share democracy and great values together, I believe Somalia will break a lot of barriers and will get the rightful recognition that it needs. I am. <laughs> we need your help, and I am putting you on the spot to be the second champion of Somaliland in the Canadian Parliament. Thank you.